here today to talk about 100 years of crystallography in uh, less than 18 minutes. So what I'm going to do is give you a kind of timeline as to what has gone on in the, in the last uh, uh, 100 years. And of course, as you can see, I, I've looked at quite a bit of that, which is probably why I was chosen. <laughs> So we start with the discovery of X-rays, and here is Röntgen in 1895, more than 100 years ago. And he discovered X-rays, um, I don't know what a really good scientist does. He noticed that there was a piece of film that was, um, or a detection system that, that was uh, detecting something happening during his experiments, and he tried to find out what it was. So he discovered x-rays, and the world uh, reacted immediately to what happened. In 1895, he discovered x-rays. Here is a picture of a foot uh, in a high button shoe. You can see what the ladies used to wear in those days in 1896. So already, this was done in Boston, and pretty much the whole world knew about x-rays, and that you could see bones, and I maybe should have shown you a picture of Frau Röntgen's hand with the, showing the uh, wedding ring. But I never could figure out which way around to put it because I understand the Germans wear the uh, wedding ring on the other hand. So I remember in the old days you had to be very careful how you labeled your ex uh, any of your x-rays. You had to cut a little uh, V at the tar and cut off the top side just to make sure you knew which uh, uh, which direction you could place the, um, uh, the film to take the X-ray diffraction picture. And then we end up with structure as well. Not only can we find out what bones look like, internal structure, a lot of you in this audience have probably had an X-ray at some time in your life, but we could also find out what molecules look like. So this was a double thing, and uh, I'm not sure Rankin even have thought about it. But I said he would be surprised to know how much we now know as a result of this discovery of X-rays. And the apparatus that was used for the, for the first diffraction experiment is pretty much the same as you will, you will see downstairs if you go to the instrument um, display there. Um, here is the source of X-rays going to the crystal and the detection system. And what has happened in the last hundred years is particularly the source of radiation and the detection system have uh, greatly improved. And uh, we're also trying, as, as you will hear in various lectures here, even, to improve the ways of getting bigger and better crystals. So the first diffraction picture um, people assume it was a terrible diffraction picture, but here is one of the first. I've seen it later. This is the first. But you can see that there's some symmetry to it. And so what came out of those early pictures was information on some of the symmetry. And here's actually the structure of the zinc lens showing the fourfold axes that you can see here. So you could learn a bit about symmetry, and you could learn a bit about um, uh, repeat units in addition to the geometry of the system. So here are the three founders. Um, there is Max von Laue, and he persuaded two of his uh, his collaborators, Friedrich Lindemann, to do the first experiment. And uh, if you want to read the paper, your German isn't very good. There are translations. Uh, there's a benchmark book on crystallography that contains uh, the translation. And then there were the Bragg's. Uh, it was Max von Laue and Friedrich Lindgren who showed that you could have diffraction of X-rays by crystals. And it was the Bragg's father, Bragg, who was well known because he had an excellent. Um, uh, it's, he, he was very good at building equipment. Equipment was uh, hot enough. And his son, W. L. Bragg. Now, when I first was do crystallography uh, as a graduate student. Uh, I did see Bragg. They were known as Old Bragg. Old Bragg was famous because half of his lab were, were women, and I always felt uh, 
the great admiration for him for that in the old days, in the 80s, late 90s and so on. He was uh, employed by the women. And his son, uh, W.L., so Bragg was important for getting good diffraction pictures, and Bragg, the younger, Lawrence Bragg, uh, was the one who um, showed how to showed Bragg's law and how to determine structure. But when I first knew him, he was quite old, and it was quite funny to, to know he was called Young Bragg. And he also was worried that um, he would not be appreciated for who he was, the son of his father. He was the one who, who proposed Bragg's law and had this whole structure. And so he always called himself Lawrence Bragg. But I remember going to a meeting, and he was... Uh, very unhappy with Kathleen Lonsdale, who was also a great crystallographer in, in there, and because she was not teaching her students how to just look at the diffraction picture and immediately say they knew where the metal iron was. He says, what is it? What's the matter with you? Why aren't you teaching, teaching them properly? So uh, in those days, one spent a lot of time looking at one's diffraction pictures and thinking about them. So there are the three. And um, even when David Phillips was doing the structure of Isocide, uh, Lawrence Bragg, young Bragg, he's the youngest man who ever got a Nobel Prize. Um, he, uh, I put there are some nice pictures of him, which you probably see in other talks, of him as a young man. But here is he later in life. But he did say he was allowed to draw some of the, the electron density maps of uh, Isocide. So he, he was in on crystallography throughout the, his entire life. And here is uh, what you might find about potassium and sodium chloride, which were the kind of compounds they first, the Braggs first looked at, because Pope and Barlow, mineralogists, were close friends of theirs. And so you can see potassium chloride, which you know must have a larger unit cell, because potassium is larger. And here is the spots are closer together. Which you also see there are missing reflections because potassium plus and chloride minus are about the same number of electrons. So you've got some ideas of um, uh, structure very early on. So in 1912, um, the first experiment was done uh, showed diffraction, and by 1914, we were knowing the structure of uh, sodium and potassium chloride. So I've made a list of some of the structures that were determined early on and who was working on them. Um, the only way to determine the structure was to use trial and error methods to guess at the structure, then look and see if uh, the resulting, you calculate structure factors and see if they agree in, to any extent with the intensities you have. Or you can look at the intensities and make a few conclusions about them. So here we have a lot of minerals, diamond, zinc, etc. I don't think I have time to go through all of them. One of the most important was hexametal benzene, which Kathleen Longsdale did in 1928. Um, <coughs> she it, although she'd been working on it for years trying to solve the structure. Um, We've, we're finally, not only are we determining crystal structures, but we're helping science along. And with the uh, sodium potassium chloride, it was shown that you had sodium plus and chloride minus, and not NaCl, which is just a bond between them. And with hexametal benzene, it was shown that the benzene ring was planar, but even much more important that each of the carbon carbon bonds were the same. So the chemists we're very happy to get that kind of information. So, so um, the equations had to be worked out, and um, uh, methods were measured, measured in cell dimensions were quickly derived. But then the structure factor, what, the equation for the structure factor in 1913, and you have to use Fourier series because you've got a repeating structure in 1915. Um, World War II delayed um, the use of this uh, because people were, had other things to worry about. But uh, by the 1920s, one pretty much knew how to do crystal structures. So, but 
trial and error methods are pretty hard, and you can use them on small minerals. But then you have, uh, by 1935, uh, Dorothy Hodgkin had shown that even proteins could di diffract X rays, and you can get nice spots on your diffraction pattern. What are you going to do with them? Well, you're not going to have a trial and error a structure of a protein, at least at that time. I mean, we know a lot now. We know what, how, how proteins are made and how you have alpha helices and beta sheets, but we haven't had any of that yet. Anyway, Linda Patterson is the next person who comes up in the story, and it's about, it's about 1934. So here we've had another 20 years. We had 20 years before the discovery of X, X rays and the diffraction of X rays. Now we have another 20 years until we come to the Patterson function. And that made a huge difference in our ability to solve structures. And um, uh, Patterson uh, had gone, he was, he was very frustrated by the fact that you couldn't just uh, measure intensities and then find a structure. So after he had done some graduate work, he took off on his own, gathered some life insurance money, and uh, went to MIT and spent his time in the libraries trying to figure out how to uh, use the intensities to get some information on the relative phases. And uh, everyone said, well, if, you're, well, if you want to do mathematics, uh, Norman Wiener is the person to see. And it turned out they both loved Gilbert and Sullivan operas. So um, Linda would go and visit Norman Wiener, and they would be singing. He, he told me this story, so that's it's all true. This information. He, uh, uh, he would be singing with Norbert, and then he'd say, and how do I go about uh, the Fourier festival? <laughs> <laughs> and Norbert you know, would go on singing, and then suddenly he'd give them an answer. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, uh, they learned quite a lot about uh, how to solve structures. And um, I'm sure all of you know the Patterson function now. Instead of using Fs as in the electron density, you're using S squares, you don't have a phase problem, and you get a map which gives you the vectors between atoms. And uh, um, if you have a heavy atom in the structure, of course, it's really nice. But uh, um, for those of us who are puzzle solvers, even if you don't have a heavy atom, it's kind of fun to try and solve the question. So here is copper sulfate, which was one of the first things he looked at. Um, he was. Uh, he ended his period of trying to determine the crystal structure in the middle of the depression, so finding a job was very hard. He finally got a job as a physics professor, and uh, at Bryn Mawr, uh, was denied promotion, and you can believe that. And uh, so that's why he came to Fox Chase Cancer Center, which is where I spent a lot of my life. But anyway, here is, we all looked at Patterson maps and thought about them, analyzed them, and had drawn it how you analyze the copper sulfate Patterson map and you get the crystal structure. And then the time to go into that. So now with the Patterson map, uh, when, I, when I came on the scene, uh, people knew how to, do, I know how to do Patterson for a long time. And I went to do graduate work with Dorothy Hodgkin and we got um, a fragment of vitamin B12 which had cobalt atom in it. Nothing much else known about it. The organic chemists in Cambridge were having a very hard time um, <coughs> making products to try and get what the chemical formula was. And it, so I had a degradation product which had been crystallized because the uh, scientists at Cambridge were so frustrated by uh, not being able to get crystals that he poured a little bit of everything that he had in his, uh, all the organic chem chemicals went away to Europe for a couple of weeks, came back, and there were these beautiful crystals. That's what I got to work on. They've never been crystallized because the material's never been crystallized again, as far as I know. But it was just an act of faith, and uh, it was by the B12 without the parts that we knew about, and it left the middle part, which looked sort of like a porphyrin, but we knew it wasn't a porphyrin. And you could find, I, this, this slide is just to show find the heavy metal in the, uh, uh, you could find the heavy metal in, in the Patterson map. So I didn't have to do three-dimensional work. 
In those days, people didn't work in three dimensions. They didn't have to. They liked to work with simple symmetric structures in two dimensions. I think about it. And that Doris Hodgkin said, you have, with the thing with 70 at carbon atoms, you just have to work in three dimensions. So I had 3,500 refractions to measure. In those days, we did it on film, on a vice with a Weissenberg camera, and you estimated the intensities by eye. So if I walked down the street at any time, I could see these circles of <laughs> spots. <laughs> but uh, they were quite good data. You put several several films together, and each each uh, film kind of cut down to a certain extent the intensity of the spot with a factor of about 1.3. So you've got, you've got a tremendous amount of data. And uh, we were able to take the position of the heavy atom, which I showed you in the previous slide, heavy atom, and do an electron density map based only on the, on the and the cobalt was in a more general position than the, 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 the people of the vitamin, the vitamin itself, which was not getting good data at that point. And so here is what came just from one, um, from that map. And you can see pretty much the whole arrangement of, of rings, and two rings directly uh, connected, which is the special part of the coronary ring. And, uh, this one has a, a, a bridging atom, a bridging atom, a bridging atom. So we did the next stage, we put in all these atoms except for this one, which we were uncertain of, and now it's turned up. So that's how the structure was solved. And uh, um, at that time, uh, Ken Trubright came into our uh, sphere of work, and he was interested in working on the new computer that they had at UCLA, Swap the South American automatic computer, and he wanted some B12 work. He wanted to work on B12 because that was one of the larger structures. And one, so he helped with the refinement, so we corresponded back and forth for a while, uh, solving the structure, trying to find its atom. Now, if you're going to do the structure of something like a vitamin, and it's important, as Darren Hodgkin said, you've got to get it right and you can't tell people what's going on until you're sure what your answer that. Anyway, one time, um, Ken was putting in the data, the coordinates of the atom, and he mistyped a number, and he put an atom here. You can sort of see that it's in a rather funny position. And he wrote, he said, I've been up all night for two nights, and I'm just absolutely exhausted, and it's all wrong. And he said, don't worry, we're learning about it. And so we were beginning to learn how to refine non central symmetric structures. Can you believe it? Am I out of time? No, two minutes. Okay. Okay, so uh, here you can see where the uh, atom was supposed to be. Here it appears, and then we were able to refine it. So then comes isomorphous replacement, it was important to solve small structures. Which is those of the atoms, and of course, has fallen uh, into the use of uh, protein crystallographers. Hexamethyl benzene, I'm leading into direct methods, and one of the um, uh, one structure that Dick Vanderhelm and I had, we thought we would try Parker-Casper inequalities, which had just been used successfully to solve the boron hydrate. And uh, we found that you couldn't, couldn't use Harvey Casper inequalities unless your U values, at least you had some U values greater than a half. And we didn't have any U values greater than a half. So the two of us multiplied all our U values by two, and then we had a <laughs> We saw the structure, and then I had to report it as an ACA So it's kind of embarrassing. But here we go to that. I just want to highlight that another important discovery was absolute configuration. And that was very important in the early 1950s. Faith would show that you could use anomalous scattering to determine absolute configuration. And then Carol Johnson here with some thought showed how we can help the biochemists along. 
So for a lot of time, people spend a lot of time um, studying absolute configurations. And uh, this is uh, Lily and Kaikali, the people at top. But he showed that then if you have a deuterium and a hydrogen, you can actually get the absolute configuration of it. And what happens in the end is you can tell the student chemistry of the um, uh, reaction. So here we have that now we have better crystals. We've learned to control the environment, put them in capillaries if they're proteins, uh, zero gravity, attention to some of the uh, plate diagrams as uh, shown by uh, people like me. Better radiation, better X-ray tubes. We used to learn how to. Uh, sorry, I'm going to better radiation. Uh, we learned how to look after X-ray tubes that were dying, rotating anodes, synchrotron radiation, neutron radiation. Better methods of measuring the data. So photographic film, which for a while we had to worry because uh, Kodak was no longer making the best stuff that we the film that we wanted. Now a different way of scanning of um, the fraction back picture in improvement in detection devices, area detectors, and image plates, and computing, which is just fantastic. I mean, I did my first calculations on a horror machine, which was invented in for the 1890 US census and only had these numbers. <laughs> and so we had to use when we used cars as input because hard disk realized it had to be important and uh, had to pool it into the same little whole lot of leading lines because it was a negative number uh, led to uh, paint the top of the cards to keep up cosine even and cosine odd as we were using Bieber's Lipson type scripts to do the addition and of course now computer graphics has meant we no longer have to build the three-dimensional models that we built in those days, because you can see them on the computer. So just to remind you uh, quickly, because I'm, I'm out of time, I think, of the few uh, structures. Penicillin is shown to have a four-membered ring, uh, three-dimensional. DNA, you all know about, and uh, pulled fibers, and the crystals of the dodecanus still have the sampling of the same diffraction pattern, so it's very useful for teaching about it intermolecular interactions and the use of X-ray diffraction to follow the courses of quite complicated reactions. And then of course all the wonderful stories that you're hearing here at this meeting. So it's been a big change from the original days when we had to think about, or when people had to think about uh, trial and error methods to solve structures. Now we have, we have a lot more techniques for dealing with it. Thank you.